Well, it's time to remember. Well, All right, my dear friends, my dear friends, hello. My name is Mano Ilya, and you're listening to The Study of Stuff. Thank you for tuning in. It has been a while since I've released anything. The last thing I released, I guess, was Nature's Bits, which you can kind of hear in the background. Check out my music if you like uh, on my website, manoelia.com. You'll also find all the podcast stuff. Click on the podcast link, take you to the podcast, click the music, it'll take you to the music. Okay. Now, um, this episode with my interview with Ben Joseph Stewart, I was really looking forward to this this uh, this interview. Um, I had booked it before I had left for Mexico. Actually, I booked it before I even knew I was coming to Mexico. So um, we had booked it for November 29th. I arrived in Mexico on November 28th. So I didn't even have any time to kind of settle into where I was and all that stuff. My mind was all over the place, jet lagged. I had a crazy week beforehand trying to get ready to come to Mexico. But I decided to do the podcast anyways. I also had some new gear that I had never used before and didn't have time to actually kind of test it. So um, that was not a good idea. So my microphone doesn't end up working because I couldn't get it to work. As well as I lost my video feed of me, the video of me. So you won't be seeing that if you're watching this um, on Odyssey or YouTube or wherever you're watching it. Um, And if you're listening to it, you'll notice that my audio isn't super awesome because of those technical difficulties. Couple that up with the Airbnb I was at had some poo 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 shitty crappy internet so uh my internet feed and my connection kind of times out halfway through well like half hour into the interview so i didn't get a chance to kind of ask a lot of the questions i wanted to ask and where i wanted to take the interview but i decided to post this anyways because uh ben shares some really interesting facts about his life uh we discuss uh the importance of kind of grounding yourself and you know keeping yourself grounded throughout the whole journey of looking into conspiracy theory and how that kind of relates to spirituality uh the mystery schools was kind of get into a little bit of that i really wanted to con- continue my conversation with ben and talk more about cycles of time the yuga cycles uh evolution of consciousness um how the truth movement evolved from where it was in the early 2000s to where it is today Hopefully I can get Ben on, Uh, we can talk a little bit more another time, Uh, go a little bit deeper into spirituality and all that kind of stuff. But anyways, here is my interview with Ben Joseph Stewart. Now for those of you who don't know who Ben Joseph Stewart is, he's a great creator. He is a documentary filmmaker. He's made such documentaries as Awakening in the Darkness, DMT Quest, Psychedelia, Limitless, and Esoteric Agenda, Chimatica, one of my favorites, Ungripped. The Magic Plant, and of course, he's the producer of the Ben Joseph Stewart podcast, as well as Waking Infinity series. Ben Joseph Stewart is a musician, he's a father, he's an amazing researcher, and an all-round great person. Um, I really enjoyed my conversation with Ben Joseph Stewart, and I hope uh, I can have him back on again to finish our conversation. Here is my episode with the great and wonderful Ben Joseph Stewart. All right, welcome to the study of stuff. And officially, we have relocated to Mexico. As of yesterday, uh, my family and I, we all came down to Mexico. And um, I think it's very appropriate that our, our my guest, Ben Stewart, today, um, I think that kind of fits me being in Mexico and interviewing uh, Ben for the first time. Um, now, Ben, I want to really welcome you, like, and actually thank you for doing this because I know you're a super, super busy guy, especially now. Yeah, man, do I appreciate the opportunity? I love being able to chat about these kinds of topics, and uh, I know we've been trying to make this happen for a while. So excited about it! Awesome. Um, well, I just want to tell you, like, to the audience as well, why Ben is important in my journey. Uh, early on, I kind of started going down the rabbit hole. For me, it began with looking into and studying consciousness. Uh, I was reading a lot of Greg Baden, um, Drumvalo Melchizedek at the time, some Rupert Sheldrake, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, I was also kind of looking into what we would call conspiracy theory. Um, 
I was looking into some David Icke, uh, Michael Tessarian, and so on and so forth. And I end up seeing this uh, suggestion, Esoteric Agenda. So I clicked on it, and this is back in the day when uh, it was Google Video, way before YouTube. Well, not way, but before YouTube. And yeah. uh, oh boy, did I get into something. Uh, and from there, I um, went into Chimatica, another one of Ben's films. Um, and what I really appreciated about the perspective uh, and how you presented the information, it wasn't just about focusing on the conspiracy and such. Um, you discussed a lot of issues that I was interested in at the time, but you really always found a way to kind of bring it back to consciousness uh, and our participation in the lives we live and how we can change them. And that you almost felt like you were putting in a little bit of a warning, uh, especially at the end of Chimatica, kind of letting us know not to overdo the conspiracy aspect of it and kind of look at it more as a evolutionary uh, process. Uh, mm. And I really liked how you, you you brought it together with the whole gestation period of, uh, of us, of us humans. Um, so where I wanted to begin is how did it start? How did the journey for Ben, how did it start? How did you go from birth to Chimatica? And then I want to explore what happened after Chimatica and where we are today. Sure. Yeah, man, I've gotten, uh, I've gotten quite good at being able to um, make succinct a quite involved and long story. Basically, I was an army brat. That basically, I've I've had people recently be like, they don't know what that means. That means my parents were in the military, and I traveled a lot. So I was born in Tacoma, Washington, moved to Savannah, Georgia, Fort Rucker, Alabama, Florida, and then out to Kwajalein, the Marshall Islands, which is in between Hawaii and um, Micronesia somewhere. It's three degrees above the um, equator, and it's got an interesting history, and the Marshallese are indigenous, uh, obviously indigenous. They they, um, are considered, they have shamanic practices. Uh, Part of my tattoo uh, has that influence on it. This is an evolving storyboard um, symbolically on my body. But um, so lived in Kwajalein, Came down with tuberculosis, had no treatment there because it was such a small island, but I had a really good connection. Not, I, I can't say I had a really good connection with the indigenous, but they were they were very sweet and very welcoming of, of having their customs learned. Moved to Hawaii for treatment. They were not open to Whitey or Howley um, being involved in their ceremonies, even taking an interest in what they do. Um, and for that, I, I experienced a lot of racism, but I also understood it in a different way. I, I think I intuitively understood before I even understood colonialism and all that, um, that, um, that we are a wounded people more than any specific detail. We're a wounded people back then. And this is all before the age of 10. And so I moved to Connecticut, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, then out to, mm-hmm. you know, Boulder, Texas, a bunch of different places. Uh, I never stopped traveling. And I was mostly into music. I was a lot into, and this may come up during our conversation, I was a lot into sports until a very pivotal moment in my life. I was playing football, soccer, and um, baseball. And then I broke my ankle at age 12 on a growth plate. And it was in the same hour as a friend of mine, Ryan Theobald, died, uh, was hit by a car um, as he was walking his bike down the road. And that was a pivotal turning point. Didn't even understand why, but I left the the sports field and I went into music. And when I started exploring music, I was really into Chili Peppers and Sublime and then Rage Against the Machine, Nine Inch Nails, a lot of like System of a Down bands that were showing the cycle of time that it was in. The 90s was this like unraveling of um, the narrative of like girls, 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 America, make your money, freedom, all that stuff. You felt the unraveling. So my music took that turn and I really became outspoken about something that I didn't even fully understand yet, which was the condition of the world, the human condition. And so I'd been into psychedelics since I was 14, but I finally... uh, Basically, I saw the word ayahuasca in a book and I instantly looked it up and I found out how I could do ayahuasca. So I went down to South America. I did it with Howard Lawler, Don Howard, uh, Don Robert, and um, showed me that psychedelics inside of a ceremonial container 
which is just the set and setting. Like, you know, how do you prepare the mind and how do you prepare the environment for the best possible stuff to come out of a psychedelic uh, experience? And they've been doing it for 10,000 years safely as a spiritual path, but also as a, you know, a healing modality and a medicinal routine. And um, that caused me to see that so much more was happening in the world. And so I decided I, you know, I had already actually made Esoteric Agenda. And that came from I was touring with the band and everyone basically was asking like, dude, we, we really dig your lyrics, but we want to understand more like what exactly are you talking about? So I said, you know, right on, um, let me just make a film. I was all about doing the the more artistic, more involved, more, you know, elaborate, not just so on the nose kind of um, expressing to people. So I made a film and it was called Esoteric Agenda. It's supposed to be 15 minutes about the band, had nothing to do with the band, it was two hours and six minutes. And by the, you know, you mentioned it was on Google videos first. I was doing it just as stream of consciousness. I didn't map anything out and then like build the skeleton and then build on top of it. I started at this point and it just grew and grew and grew until it terminated. But as I was putting these 15 minute chunks up on uh, Google videos, people were saying like, dude, when are you going to finish this film? I want to buy literally a thousand copies right now. And I had a handful of people, like almost a dozen people buy a thousand copies and uh, just so they could hand them out. So I obviously gave them dope ass deals and, um, I did whatever I could. And I said, like, this is not my film, you know, like this is for the world to use. There were people that were taking entire sections of my film and putting it in their film, which is yeah. partially what I did with Esoteric Agenda. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, man, this is this is the new wave of how people are claiming the public domain of art and video out there. And they're saying that helps tell my story, too. But then there's laws that are like, you know, what's plagiarism, what's this, that, and the other. And like, I wasn't even 100% hip to that. Peter Joseph, when he made Zeitgeist, wasn't 100% hip to that. So so then I talk about Peter Joseph. I did a plant medicine and I started and I watched Zeitgeist for the first time. That was when I realized I, I have to tell this story. That was part and parcel with people saying, what's, what's the message of the band? Those two colliding, or those three, because there was a plant medicine involved, colliding, turned me into a filmmaker. I just knew that that was my path. What, so what I made us a ban- Oh, sorry. How, how did your band feel about, uh, well, the topics that you cover? Were they were they into it or, or not? Because um, I'm a musician as well, and my band, well, my ex-band, wasn't so into the stuff that I would write about. How about you? Mm-hmm. Very interesting question, because... Um, I think it was a dual-edged sword. Um, everybody who gets into conspiracy, and let me just say, I think that that conspiracies and looking into them and looking into people who are speaking about such things is part of a well-rounded, holistic understanding of reality. That's, mm-hmm. that's all it is. And mm-hmm. it's also the mystery schools because it's the hardest stuff to look at while mm-hmm. maintaining a level nervous system. But if you can do it, you know, it's it's got more rewards than most people think. A lot of people they see the the bottom common denominator of conspiracy, which are the annoying people that never realize sometimes it's the wrong thing to say at the wrong time. Sometimes there are sensitivities that are justified by conspiracy speakers um, because like it, it's so urgent. I don't care if I hurt your feelings. It's so urgent. So yes, there's that aspect of it, but I believe that it's a part of a well-rounded diet. Even people like Charles Eisenstein who don't really buy into it reads David Icke, reads through all the, you know, all these kinds of things. And that's super respectable regardless of what you end up believing afterwards. So my band, to get to your question, they love the fact that a lot of people were coming to our shows. They, they really appreciate it. And they never told me like, Ben, you're off your rocker. They never said that. They never shamed me for any of it. Um, they were really phenomenal people, human beings. And we also had great chemistry and they helped me evolve on my path. And I'll tell you this, if I didn't have my band during my formative years of getting into conspiracy, I wouldn't have had the checks and balances on 
hey, man, we're at a party and people want to tell dick and fart jokes and you're sitting there talking about Building 7 in 9-11. Yeah, I've been that guy. Like, <laughs> and everyone everyone who's gotten into conspiracies has. Yeah. And I think it's it's actually valuable to do such a thing. Hopefully you don't really burn bridges, but everything dies. You know, everything ends. All yeah. cycles come to an end. So life is also, it's not just about building bridges, it's about burning bridges. And I think people forget that. And I think people forget that there's not just a gift, but a beauty to conspiracy. And in the hardest of times that humanity will face, regardless of what you believe about it, when the stress and the pressure is globally on, you see some of the most beautiful aspects coming out of the human character. It's not going to be highlighted on CNN and Fox News, but it's there, right? You know, it's not as clickbaity. Um, but sometimes it is if it's captured correctly. But most of the time, you know, when there's when there's a really genuine, beautiful moment happening, unless there's like five or ten people just spectating, you don't see everyone reaching for their phone and being like, oh, this is such a tender moment of humility and an argument that resolved. No, you don't like it's annoying to have these things filmed. So we don't know how to highlight the fact that some great part of the awakening is happening right now, too. It's not just a horrible awakening to a prison planet. So um, I guess let, let me answer your question succinctly. What did my band think about it? How did they respond to it? They loved the fact that people were coming out to the shows and they, they said, Ben, sell your DVDs alongside the, um, you know, the, the CDs at the concerts. And I started doing that and it became a residual income for me. And then I, I, I think I felt like I was experiencing a lot of guilt for various things, you know, God knows why we actually really hold on to guilt and shame. But I was starting to experience guilt. And at this point, I didn't think I knew what love was. I didn't think I understood relationships, you know, um, especially intimate um, relationships. And uh, as soon as I met my now wife in Amsterdam, my life started falling apart. I was, I was reaching like not a rock bottom because I don't think such a thing exists. It's just, you know, it's just an endless hole of imagination of our worst fears coming to fruition. But I was falling in it. I was falling deep into it. I didn't think I was a good person. Uh, I had people publicly saying like, you know, Ben, your films changed my life. And in my heart, I felt like, yeah, but I also fucked up a few lives. You know, there were people who said right. they left their wives, that they left their kids. They ran off into the woods to wait this thing out. I was like, what thing life? Like, what are you running from? And I didn't understand it. I didn't understand how somebody could arrive at that conclusion. And I didn't want to shame them for it. So I understood like, Ben, you just don't get that some people are suffering in ways you can't quite conceive of because you just haven't heard their stories. But I came to understand that making films and getting feedback from people, especially the people who dislike what I have to say okay. is part of the mystery school. So um, we can get into this more a little later, but I think that there is a mystery school and th there are many mystery schools where there's actual fraternities where people gather, fraternities and sororities where people gather and they know the members of the secret society. Right. The mystery school that I'm talking about is esoteric. You can only access it from within when you try to speak about it or prove it to other people it starts losing its translation. It starts losing what it actually is. I think being an artist is our entry point and our greatest work to do inside the mystery school of those who realize there's real work to do on this planet. But as soon as we start saying, yeah, because, you know, we, we definitely have work because, you know, Bill Gates or, you know, the Jews or, you know, Muslims or, you know, it's the technocrats or wealthy billionaires or you name whatever word you want to place on it. By the time it gets to the lingual connective between, you know, other people, once it gets into those concepts, it loses the real meaning of what it is. And it's the easiest explained by being a good person and having an impact that you know um, is harmonious. It, it, is, it is inviting for harmony. So I do it with film. I do it through art. Um, but I also believe some people, you know, they just need to work on their character and believe what they believe and, and not add more... Uh, inflammation to the social media world. That's their entry point into the mystery school. Um, I know I went off on a tangent there, but I guess the thing, the, the thing about the band, 
specifically was they taught me almost a rock and roll thing. It was like kind of how to be hip outside of the belief system. You know, right. like the, there's the, the rock and roll edge, which is like the, yeah, I'm cool. I can talk about whatever and everything, but I'm not too anything. I'm not too conspiracy. I'm not too this. I'm not too that. Right. It's a well-rounded diet. I'm me and I'm accessing these tools at my disposal. Um, the band really helped me refine that. So I didn't turn into some pundit, some conspiracy pundit, if you will. Well, that's, I like you brought up a lot of really interesting points there, um, especially from that time period in the let's call it the alternative research uh, movement of the time. It was very common, I remember, to get stuck into that. Let's, I want to use the word new age deception. Not that, that there's a, an issue with the new age, generally speaking, but there is an aspect of it that almost feels as if like the secret societies that you're referring to and, and the occult in general, they'll kind of throw, like you'll have 80% truth and that 20% that they make up or they use as a way to kind of distract you from seeing your own uh, power, your own worth, where you're almost kind of looking at uh, in the, so you use the word esot. So in uh, my background is Greek. Esoter means eso means within and exo yeah. is without. And they constantly want you to look for an answer without and never kind of look within. And um, I noticed that in the way your career has kind of un unfolded. Um, so I've been kind of paying attention for a while. And I noticed how a lot of your, your, your films have evolved, um, especially your recent uh, Awakening in the Darkness. Um, how do you explain that with, from within your own life, like your own uh, situations and events that occur in your life. How do you keep from falling to the new age deception? Hmm. Yeah, good question. I think new age, like conspiracy, like left, right, like capitalist, like Buddhist, like Confucian. Um, I think these are all languages to put an ineffable experience that can be explained infinitely in many ways including contradictory ways. New age is just a way of explaining what we're experiencing. And I think new age is important because it plays a very valuable role in showing that we can't over science either. You can over new age. And that's like overdosing on new age is where you're just floating above the ground. It doesn't feel rooted in logic. It, it feels rooted only in you're wanting to believe it so bad. And yes, there's a truth to we create our own reality, we collectively do, we individually do. Yes, there's a truth to that, but that truth needs to be rooted in the in in this collective hallucination or projection or world that we're living in. It needs to be rooted in it. And New Age, when it goes overboard, um, it's it's too expansive, airy. Uh, it's not rooted anywhere. It has no real center of gravity. Science can become over science. And I think new age is naturally what happens inside a people. Like, I'll, I'll say this, in religion, when, um, in, in Catholicism specifically, when you have people who need to shun relationships with anything but God, and you see, well, of course they're going to, you know, abuse children when children are always around and they... they have found no real way, no, I mean, real as in a healthy way to express their sexuality. So it comes out perverse. Right. New age is, new age is a healthy response to over science. Right. So it shows us like, yeah, but intuition is also a thing. Yeah. I'm also right. Even though your science says this, I'm also right. There's a, there's a truth to that, but you can over new age too, where it's like, yeah, but there's also science and science is really, it's not fact. It's best practices based upon observed um, events. Because yes. when you have a, an experiment, you observe the events, you document them, you have double blinds to make sure that the placebo and other aspects of consciousness didn't creep in, which is a whole other concept that we try to remove consciousness 
from the experiment and then call this a fractal of real life science. This is a fractal of real life. What did you have to do to get come up with that science? Oh, remove all the intelligent consciousness out of it. So placebo effect couldn't you know, creep in. And sometimes it's, it's outside of the pharmaceutical thing, science, and I'm not knocking science, but we frame it as, you know, um, let's say we're not experts in science and not even the scientists truly are. Science is a, an aspect of consciousness. So how do I balance the, the new age and the science and like, you know, overly this and overly that I actually have a, um, I usually have it with me. Let's see if I could just draw it for you actually yeah because i have this wheel that i'll show you it's, it starts with here so i call it spar s p a r you might have heard me talk about this before science philosophy art and religion i actually like art to be at the top so spra doesn't sound as cool as spar <laughs> But, you know, science is, I'm going to put this super quickly, probably quicker than I ever have before, but like science is just, it means to know. And that's just raw data comes at you. You're a child. You're, you're, it's not tabula rasa, like you come in as a blank slate, but close, closer than we, the conditioned. So you come in, science comes at you and you may, it can't sit idly by, you experienced something. So your philosopher your inner philosopher starts to kick in and make sense out of what you just experienced. Then once that happens, you like philosophy is also coming to understand your place inside of this understanding of the world. So there's the world, there's other, and then there's self. So you experience something as an I, as an individual, and then you come up with a concept of philosophy of what that means but that can't sit idly by, so you commit to it. And rel religion actually comes from the root word religare, which means to bind to. Think Daniel LaRusso and Mr. Miyagi, the bonsai tree, they wrap it, they bind it together so it can heal because it's meant to be one. So when you have a philosophy about who you are, how you fit into the world, that doesn't want to sit idly by. It wants to commit to something. It's the natural next step in it. And then once you commit to something, what do you think the next step is? Art. It's to express it out into the oh. world, and that's that's always art. So, like, once you commit to something, you do it, and that's yes. art. But once you do something, then you've affected the outside world. You've influenced it. You dropped, like, a chemical reaction into it, and then you're going to start getting feedback. People or animals or nature or even your own physiology and biology will start responding to your act. And the act is your artistic expression onto life. So once you act, then you start getting feedback that, that makes a story about you, a story of your art, the things that you've done in life. And that informs because you get feedback, which is, again, more experience of the outside world. But now that experience is mixed with it, that experience is coming back at you, not just because you exist and you're looking at reality, but because you've done something to reality. You've acted and you're getting feedback. And that changes your philosophy, which changes your commitment, which changes your art. So that's the secret society. And that's how we kind of like barrel forward in life. I look at it that way. When I'm ever too much the scientist, I know that one thing that is actually, and this is why I should have put R down here, um, science over science um, can can really conflate religion and religion, the binding to something, which is an agreement, it's a contract, it's a, I, I believe in this. And then this changes. So your belief has to change with it. But that's an aspect of consciousness that inevitably, you see how I didn't close the circle here? Yep. Because once you act in the world, what starts coming to you is different and history doesn't repeat. You don't go back into a, a blank slate receiving this. You now have a, a memory that you acted and part of this is because you did it as well. Part of what's coming to you as feedback is because you acted in the world and you're getting feedback. So it starts to turn into this spiral instead. Yes. So history doesn't repeat yes. itself. It rhymes very yes. closely. Oh, Mark Twain, yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I had only heard it. I never knew who said that uh, quote. So so that's pretty much how I keep myself balanced is if I'm too science, then I'm going to yeah. start speaking to other people as if science 
is a, a lens by which you can understand all of reality. And you can't. You can't understand reality separate from the influence of your philosophy of reality. True you can't true. experience reality separate from the commitments that you made and how that changed you or separate from the actions that have come out, whether conscious or unconscious actions. So you can't separate science from all that. And that's what I see in the world today. You know, I, I, I hate using names, but when Fauci says to criticize me is to criticize the science. Like, right. that's really no, really and, and I, I don't believe, yeah. And I don't believe in criticizing people per se, unless you do it in such a beautiful, inspirational <clears throat> way that it's almost like a, you know how on Stomp the Yard or, you know, bring it, you know, bring it on. You know, you see these dance troops dance fighting at each other and they kind of like coax each other, like they stomp towards one another. Like what, you man enough to do this? They're Aikidoing. They're they're removing harm. They've neutralized that. They've turned it into a dance. They understand that they will not cross a certain relational abuse threshold. But there's, you know, there's something about like criticizing. I don't mind criticizing as, as long as it's done artistically. I wanted to throw that out there. But when when he says like, you know, he, when he says science, what he's really talking about is data mm -hmm. and data from a certain perspective of institutions that you can't remove their influence from the bottom line and the, the shareholder interest that they have to appease. Right. So you can't remove that. You can't say that they're just scientists and science is about killing old science. That's what yes. science is. It's about destroying old ideas and coming up with new ways of looking at it. So so that's you know, that's how I try to stay balanced is by acknowledging when I don't <laughs> feel it like I'm actually in my center. Yep. See, I, I really like that approach that you're taking, because uh, oftentimes actually I'm reminded a lot of uh, how science was practiced. Uh, pre-Descartes with uh, da Vinci and Pythagoras. We have scientists, artists, philosophers. Uh, in, they're into nutrition and body movement. They don't look at life as uh, com compartmentalized, as I, I'm just a scientist. And they kind of view life similar to watching uh, David Bohm and Krishnamurti, you know, having those conversations back in the early 80s. Here you have a philosopher, a metaphysicist, and then you have a physicist, uh, both kind of finding common ground and they're able to kind of share ideas and they're, they're also able to kind of connect each other's world and realize that reality is not one thing, it's many things and every aspect of that makes us sort of a, a scientist experimenting with ideas but until it becomes a creation, something that you can see, hear, hold, it's hard to pass that information on in a way where it's um, it's more subtle and it goes deeper, I believe. You know, it's like when you when you hear like a, a knuckle bear song and you're just sitting there and you don't really pay attention to the lyrics, and then you're walking down the street and all of a sudden you start speaking the lyrics, and you're like, oh, he's talking about this or that. It kind of seeps into your consciousness. Uh, and to go back to um, your circle, I, I really like that. Uh, it's a great way of keeping yourself grounded. Um, I interviewed Amit Goswami um, early, early nice. this year, and uh, he had mentioned the uh, do, be, do, be, do. So you do, and then you be, like you rest, that resting. Integration. Exactly, to integrate it. So a lot of what you're saying uh, reminds me of a lot of all of these individuals and how they kind of viewed the world. Walter Russell also came to mind. Uh, mm -hmm. So going back to your journey, so from esoteric esoteric agenda to chimatica, and then from there, you're, uh, you now meet your wife, um, you kind of have a crisis of sort, I guess you could say. Um, how do you deal with it? And how do you move forward in your, in your career to like kind of go where you are now? Okay, yeah, so that crisis, um, that was after I made three films. <clears throat> so I made Esoteric Agenda, Chimatica, and Ungrip. And um, two years later, I leave the band. Um, and my now wife, Barbara, and I, we, we start just road tripping across the country. We lose ourselves to find ourselves. So we went to, you know, the Redwoods of California, 
Uh, we go to Burning Man. We go to all these festivals. We start traveling and doing speaking tours around the world together. It's quite impressive. Um, and then we uh, get pregnant, you know. So um, my daughter starts coming along, and that's when I realized, like, okay, um, all of this makes sense, but it's moving too fast for me to focus on now. I need to compartmentalize and just figure out I need to start taking the financial world seriously. And maybe I should say it differently than taking it seriously. Um, I, I know people understand what I mean, but I love reframing these things. I felt like I should start listening to the language of those who think in number, who, who think in profit and loss and risk assessment and, you know, business terms, if you think about it. And it's been a struggle for me. It's been a big struggle for me. Um, but I had to do it. I had a reason. I have a daughter now, you know, like, and I also have two twin boys as well. Um, so it was this, yeah, Ben, like you've, you've been able to handle when crisis arrives before this on very little money, you know, very few, you know, favors from other people. You've been able to survive that, but now you have a family. Imagine a crisis now. And, um, I mean, so for a while, I was wondering, is film going to do it? Is film really going to do it? Is, is it viable? Is it scalable? Am I going to be able to make any money and feed my family? Am I being unrealistic about the world is changing? I, I started making films and people were buying DVDs. Then after two years, no one was buying DVDs anymore. It's just no one was doing it. So, um, so then I was like, man, I really have to understand business more if I'm going to navigate this. And now I have to, or I have to hop fields and find something else. So that was a real challenging point for me because it was this question like, okay, Ben, you're doing something for a living and now you're going to start feeding a, an entire family with the money that you make on it. Do you believe in it? Are you going to keep going in this direction? Cause you're going to experience hard, challenging times. Do you believe in it enough not to abandon it when you get to those challenging times or do you want to find a nine to five? I thank the Lord that I either just, I, I just blazed in the direction cause I didn't want to reevaluate what I had started. So I was like, filmmaking it is, I'm just going to see what I can do with filmmaking. And then Gaia all of a sudden just comes in and says, Ben, come out to Gaia and interview, um, not for a job to interview on one of the shows. So I went out, I interviewed on, um, uh, George Nuri's show. You still there? Hope I didn't cut out. Well, if we're still recording, um, I interviewed on one of George Nuri's shows, which was called um, Beyond Belief. And Beyond Belief was, um, it was just one of the random shows. I'm trying to get back on point. I, I see that you had like a technical issue. Um, and then right after the CEO brought me over and said, do you want to become a producer of, you know, and start producing some content? And I said, yes, I would love to produce some content. So I started um, working on a show called Psychedelica and Psychedelica led to, I realized that I did not want to be in the corporate world. So I knew that I wanted to turn freelance again, but I didn't have the impetus to do it. But then my sister dies um, in 2018 and I, I reached this brick wall in front of me where I did not want to move forward anymore as being in the corporate world. And so I went independent. I went freelance. I went as a host and things were okay for maybe six months and then they just fell apart. And as they fell apart, what then happened was... My, my entire family experienced a crisis period. And that crisis was we, we landed actually living in the basement of a friend's for almost a year. A um, lot of financial hardship and so little time because we were raising twins. Uh, and, you know, at this time, like a three and a half, four year old daughter. Um, it was so much work that I couldn't even hardly do anything but help my wife. So we had to live off this favor of friends. And so there was this grace period in my art that I had to experience. Um, I had to surrender to the fact that I was not in control of the ship. 
but I was okay. It was being taken care of. And that eventually led to uh, some films being offered to me that paid a little bit more. And then the, you know, 2020 happened. And I, all of a sudden, people are start demanding more video content. They want more content, online content. Give it to me. It's got to be good. It's got to, everyone wants to build the new Netflix. So that's how it kind of like started growing for me again. It was hard to, to navigate those tricky um, business waters, if you will. But finally, it's it's on a roll and it's moving quickly. And I realized that it too is part of that mystery school I was talking about earlier. Still with me, my man? <laughs> 